Right. So we've talked a lot about building an app that can be installed and extends the product directly. But what if you have an existing cloud service? How can you integrate the two when it doesn't necessarily make sense to have your users live in the Elastian product? So in this talk, get into the flow with the OAuth 2. We'll learn about a lot about uh, what we talked about at the keynote earlier this morning about how to use OAuth 2 authenticated code grants to enable users to integrate with a cloud service. Our next speaker is a software developer from Sydney, Australia. Please join me in welcoming Arrow. Thanks. Um, just a thing. <laughs> Something's missing. Just, just a minute. Uh. Okay, thanks. So I'm Er, and I'm going to give you give you a talk about OAuth two, and specifically about about um, the authorization code grant flow for OAuth two, also known as real law. So I guess I guess you all saw the keynote. So this talk is just um, going to dive dive a bit deeper into the details details of the OAuth two flow. So we we'll look look a bit closer how to actually build build an app using OAuth two. Yeah. So, in the last couple of years, well, maybe, maybe, maybe in the in the last uh, last ten years, there's been this change about how we how we build software. So, so we have this thing called cloud, and all the all the software is moving into cloud. But it's not just uh, just changing changing where we run run the software. It's also also changing how how we think about the software, how we work with the software, and how the how how different kinds of software products integrate with each other, and let's go into the details. Um, so yesterday, back in the old days, you almost always always used to have used to have your own server. You had your own hardware deployed to your own own data center, and then you maybe had like seven or nine different firewalls on um, on on top of your software, so that nobody could reach reach out. That uh, software running in your own data center, and then what's also also common was that all of the uh, software was provided by by a single vendor. So all the all the big vendors tried to try to come up come up with kind of pre-integrated solutions that did everything for some target segment like uh, software developers. You would buy buy all of your software development tools from one vendor and they would be integrated with each other. And then all the all the all the vendors kind of tried to protect all of these walled gardens so anybody so so that nobody could integrate with that easily. And really like there wasn't because nobody nobody could talk to your server anyway, so there wasn't wasn't really any point in integrating. So <coughs> today Sorry. Um, today, today we are running running the services services in cloud. So that um, that removes the removes the firewall. So any any software can talk to any software really. And then also also what what people like to do is that they like to like to pick pick the best best tools for the job. They don't always want ev they don't always want that everything provided by one 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 single vendor. So you generally try to try to use kind of best of the breed solutions from for like specific tasks and then we also also expect seamless integration between between the different tools so even even if they are provided by different vendors we expect them to them to work together um, okay and let's let's take a look at an example so this is uh, Gmail so as you might know you can't even buy buy an Atlassian email client or Atlassian email server, even if you paid paid us a lot of money. We won't sell you one, so you have to use, so you have to use uh, use an email solution provided by something else. But then also, in the in the meanwhile, you use that email to communicate about uh, about things that happen 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 in Atlassian products. Like in this in this email email we have. We have a couple of couple of uh, links. One of them points to points. Couple of them point to Jira, and one of them points to points to a Bitbucket pull request. Now, if you look into the right hand side, 
we'll see something, something new, something that's not, not there by default and something that's not actually built by Google. So, so that's the Atlassian, Atlassian Gmail app, which will provide you some context context about all the Atlassian links in the, in the email. So for the, for the Jira ticket, you can see the, see the status, you can see when it was last updated, you can see the, see the description of the ticket and also a bunch of other information. Um, and then when we select one of those things, like in this case, we select the Jira ticket, it will, it will expand it will expand and we can also perform some actions in the, uh, in the, in the sidebar. So we could, we could, uh, we could change the, change the status of the ticket. We could leave, leave, uh, leave, leave a comment and do, do things like that. So that's all, all happening inside, inside the Gmail client. So the, so the user doesn't have to leave the, leave the application to get, get stuff done in Jira. And that's that's the kind of that's the kind of level of integration people people these days expect. Um, my second demo was about Visual Studio Code, but I think I'll just skip it because you already saw it, saw it in a keynote, and I'm kind of running late, maybe. So I'll just skip, skip it. Okay, so let's say let's say let's say you have. You have you have a software product you want to want to want to integrate with with Atlassian products. Let's say you have built built your own reporting software solution as a service, and you want to pull Jira data into it. How do I how do I build apps apps that uh, integrate integrate with Jira? So the answer is over through authorization code grant, so also known as as Trello comes from pre-elect OAuth. So it's sometimes sometimes a bit uh, sometimes a bit confusing like uh, like what all of those three legs are because depending depending on how you count you could also come up with four legs or five legs or maybe well maybe not six but uh, like five at least. But um, usually usually uh, these are the three legs. So you have you have you have a resource owner so that's uh, that's somebody somebody who owns a resource. So in the in the case of the Jira Gmail integration, that's that's a user who has access access to Jira. So they they have access to stuff in Jira. Um, and then you have you have a resource. So that's the that's a thing being accessed. It's a, it's um, Usually, it's a, it's it's a REST API, but like the really like the resource is that data data behind the REST API. So in the in the Jira Gmail example, that's all the all the Jira issues the user has access to. And then you have a client, and this client uh, client client is your app basically. So so in the in the Jira Gmail example, we have uh, we have some. Some uh, I think the stuff is called app code, so you implement Google Apps using using this app code, and this app code runs runs inside Google Google servers. So that's the that's the client. Okay, so this over through the thing. It's it's an industry standard. It's uh, really like the most 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 common common protocol to use to implement this kind of this kind of um, Service-to-service -service integrations in the in the cloud, and it's uh, pretty easy to implement, as we can see, as we'll see see later in the talk. And there's also a lot of tools tools not only not only for writing 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 your service, but also for debugging and uh, running the requests. Um, it's uh, user driven, so. So the app can be ad, app can be installed by the user. So you don't need an admin to install the app, and it will also run as the user. So it will respect uh, respect the user's permissions. It will only see only see stuff the uh, stuff the user can see, and it, it can only do things the user can do. Um, okay. So you have seen Ralph's talk about Connect. So at this point, you might be kind of wondering up like what's the What's, what's, what's the difference between Trello and Connect? Connect like like both are ways to ways to add build apps apps for Jira. So 
In Trello, we have user consent, so the user has to give access to their di data, their resources. And in Connect, we have, we have the admin who installs the app and then grants the access. By installing the app, grants the access to all the things in the, in the site they installed the app to. Um, Trello runs as the, as the end user, so it will execute using the end user's permissions. It will only see stuff the end user can see. Um, in Connect, we have a special system user installed, so you, which, will own, which will get some basic permissions and really like run as the, as the app, app, so you can set the, set the permissions for that system user separately. Um, that's mostly, there's also, also a way, way to do user impersonation with, with Connect, so you can also, also impersonate users. Um, Trello doesn't have any, any way to extend the, extend the UI, so, so you ca can't add things to Jira. You might be able one, d one day, it would, be, it would be possible in theory, but we don't have that yet. Um, in Connect, you can specify, specify extensions in the, in the app descriptor. But that's that's static, so you have to know you have to know beforehand what what kind of extensions you want to add. Um, let's take a look at look at an example app. So we have two things which do kind of similar stuff. So we have we have Jira Business Intelligence Solution, which will just um, pull pull data data from Jira. And it will use, use that data to compile reports and show trends and graphs and stuff, uh, stuff um, based, on, based on those issues. Um, so that would, be, that would be a good, good free low app. So that's a, that's a complete standalone solution. So, so if the user is using, using that app, using that app, they don't have to touch Jira at all. So that, that app will just pull data from Jira in the background and display that data in some different format, in some different UI. Um, and then we might have, might, have, might have like a Jira statistics app. So that app could, could show, show things like issue view counts, um, issue view counts, um, who's looking at the issue, who has been looking at the issue, what's the, What's the most viewed issue in in a project? That kind of thing, that kind kind of stuff. So it's kind of related to compiling the statistics. But the key key difference in this in this would be that that app is actually showing the showing the data data inside Jira. So it's extending extending the UI UI in Jira. It's adding adding some custom statistics in the in the issue view, for example. So. So really, like the main 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 difference between between like when when to use Trello and when to use Connect is the is the direction. So Trello is is um, is for displaying is for accessing Jira data outside Jira, and Connect is is for for accessing 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 this data accessing the features of of your third party product inside the Jira UI. So that's the main main difference. Okay, so next, uh, next we'll take a look how the how the authorization code grant flow works. How how you would actually build build an app. So, um, so we have we have the three legs again: the client, the user, and the resource. And you kind of read this from bottom to top. So, so we start with the with the client asking the permission permission from the user to access access some data. So that's the first step. First, the first, the user will have to give give permission to access access some data. And once uh, once once the user has approved, we'll get get back back an access code, and then using that access code, we can get uh, oh, sorry, we get back an authorization code, and then we can exchange that authorization code into an access token, and then in the last step at the top, we can use the Use the access token to access the resource to hit hit and rest API. Okay, so let's expand this a bit. So now now we are looking at all the all the steps all the steps you have to complete to build build a simple app. So 
First, we'll be creating, creating an app in, in app management in developer.atlassian.com. Um, and then once we have an app, we have, to, we have to create an authorization URL. So that's the URL where we'll send the end user to get the, get the consent. Um, and then once we have the consent, we'll get back an authorization code. And then, as I already mentioned, um, using, the, using the authorization code, uh, we can get, get an access token. Um, and then we have a special Atlassian specific step. So I'll explain this a bit more later, but um, when we have the access token, we don't at this point know what, what we can access using, using that access token, access token. So we have to check what kind of access we get using that access token. And then once we know that, we can call, call an API. Okay, so let's, let's start with creating an app. So that's, um, that's in developer.atlasia.com. So the app has a couple of really basic things. It has a name, of course. It has a description. Um, it has an avatar, which is displayed in a bunch of different places. We'll see, see later, and also the description. And then it has two kind of really important things, which are the client ID and then a secret. So every single app you create in app management in developer.atlassian.com will also create an OAuth client for you. So OAuth client is the kind of official term for the, for the client, so that's what's going to show up in if you read about OAuth. So you get an OAuth client with your app, and the client ID is the ID of that client, and the shared secret is a shared secret, which is used, used later. And that's something you have to, you have to store really securely, so don't, don't lose that one. Um, and now that we have an app, like rest of the flow, rest of the flow can be completed pretty much manually, even even using 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 the browser, using some command line tools, and that's actually what we do in the example. So once we have an app, we have to specify which APIs APIs um, the app can access. So in the in the app sidebar, we have this little add APIs and features tab. So we'll just click that and we get, we get a list of all the, all the APIs available. It might look a bit different for you. Some of these things are still not public and some of them might be, might be, might be going away at some point. But anyways, it's, it's a list of all the, all the APIs available. Um, so we'll just select one, which is the Jira platform API. And then we get, we, get, we get a list of scopes. So this is pretty much the same, same thing as it was with Connect. So each REST API in Jira is, is associated with, with, with some scopes. So the idea of the scopes is that you can, you can restrict like what kind of access, access your app has. So, so it's easier for the people, people installing, people authorizing the app to know what the app can access. So they might, if, for example, if you don't have to, if you don't have to write, write anything, you might want to leave that scope out and then people might be, people might be a bit, bit more happy to give, give your app, app access to that instance if they know it won't be able to change any stuff and it won't, it's, uh, yeah, so only, only select all the, all the scopes you need. Don't just pick all of them. Um, and then we have, one extra thing, so we have to specifically enable real low for the app. So that's called authorization code trends down in the in the bottom. So we'll just select that one, um, and then we need need a tiny tiny bit of configuration. So so we need some kind of way to send the access token token back to your app, and we use this thing called callback URL for that. So this this URL should be pointing back to your app. So when the when we when we um, well we'll see that later. But basically, you'll get the access code in the in in a URL parameter in this URL, and then you have to have to pick that up and you use it. But if you do it, if you just want to play play around with things, you can do this in 
in any web browser without having like a real server up somewhere. So you can just use localhost or something for the callback and just copy, copy the access token from there. Okay, so the next configuration bit is the authorization URL. So this is actually something you can, we have, we have an example in app management, so you can just copy, copy, copy from app management, but I'm just going to show how it looks like. So this is the URL where we sent the, sent the user to give the, give the consent, consent to access, access the app. So, so again, if you just want to try it locally, you can just open, open, open up the URL in, in the browser and then that's, that's it. If, if you're building a real app, you have, to, you have to pop up a new window and then point that new window into the URL. So, um, so the URL has a bunch of stuff. Most of it comes from the OWOT spec and is kind of, kind of mandatory. Some of it is a bit Atlassian specific, but still, still mandatory, it's all, all or documented in the doc, so I won't go into too much details. So we have audience, that's api.atlassian.com, that's the new API gateway we have. So, um, and then we also have the client ID, which is the client ID we got from the previous screen. And then, then we also have to specify the scopes, scopes we want to, want to ask for. So every time we send the user through the, through the constant flow, we can ask for different scopes. And then we also have to, have to specify the redirect URL. Um, that's mostly because it's in the, in the, in the, in the spec. So in, in theory, you could have multiple redirect URLs for your app. It's not supported by us yet, but might one day. So that's why you have to include this one. Um, then there's also a state parameter. So this is a bit tricky. So that state parameter is, uh, should be like a, like a unique value generated by your app. So that something will send back in the in the in the authorization uh, in the in the redirect. So you should set that into into a unique value. Save it save it in a session or something. And then once you get the get the response back, you should verify that it was that the state state matches. So that's basically to prevent fake fake authorizations for your app. Um, there's also a response type code, which comes from the spec. That means just means that you want to want an access code, authorization code back. Um, there's prompt consent, which is um, Atlassian specific thing. I'll explain that a bit more later. Okay, so when we open up that URL, when we send the send the URL send the user into that URL, this is this is what we'll see. Of oh, oh, sorry, not yet. So this is what we'll see. So we'll see the, see the avatar for the app. Um, we'll see the name of the app. We also see all the, all the scopes for the app. And all the, if we, if we can expand those to see the descriptions. And then we see this um, authorize for dropdown. And that's, um, that's really like, like an Atlassian specific thing. So Atlassian has this, um, little bit uncommon uh, user identity, identity model. So, so we only have one Atlassian account for every, every user, every physical user. So let's say, let's say, let's say you're like, like a developer building apps, apps for Atlassian. So you might have, you might have access to multiple, multiple different Jira conference instances. For example, you have you have ecosystem.atlassian.net, which is the common common Jira instance we use for most of the ecosystem related work. So that's where we have all the all the bugs we have in Connect um, and that kind of thing. So you have you have access to that one. So ecosystem.atlassian.net is one site. That's what we call site. And the and then you might also have. So if you are building an app, you might also have your private private Jira instance like mycompany.atlassian.net and you do all, all your private work on that, on that instance. So, and that's, that's another site. Um, but even like uh, with some, some SaaS products, you might have completely separate user bases for those two sites. So they might have completely different users. But um, with, the, with the Atlassian model, you actually have, you actually have, you have the, 
so like the one, one user can be, can be a member of multiple different sites. So, so that's why we show this authorized for dropdown, that you can select, select which site you want to give access to. So that's um, just to be, give, give like a bit, bit of extra security for the, for the user so that you might, you might have like some Jira instance with super secret important stuff and you might not want to have any, any third party access to that. So this is the tool, tool we use, use to control that. That's uh, going to complicate things a bit as we saw later, but right now, right now it's what we have. Um, and then we also show how many, how many installations you have in the app has in the, in the bottom. So that's just to, just to, just to provide some kind of extra, extra trust, trust for the user. So if you go, if you go and authorize Gmail and you see five installation, you might think that, okay, something, something is wrong and this could be a fake Gmail app. Um, yeah. And then you basically just click accept and what happens after you click accept is that the end user gets um, gets redirected back to the URL we specified specified earlier in app management so that's how you get the get the authorization code so the uh, URL is, is pretty simple it's um, first it has has that's the callback URL we specified earlier it's just the and then it has uh, one query parameter called code. So that's where you get the, get the authorization code. Um, and then it also has, has another one called state. And that's the, that's the state we set, set earlier. That's the state you should use to, use to prevent spoofing. Okay, and now we, have the, now we have the code. So if you have been um, paying attention, we haven't actually been checking the shared secret at any point beforehand. So at this point, at this point, we just sent you a code, but we don't, we as um, Atlassian, we don't really know that we actually sent that code to the real app. So in the next step, in the next step, we'll have to use the, use the, use the authorization code to get an access token and also to verify that we are actually talking, talking to the real app, but it's not some, some fake app. So getting an access token, token is pretty simple. It's, a, it's a just, just a post call to this URL on auth.atlassian.com. You specify some standard stuff like the, like the content type and then some JSON payloads. So you send the, send the client ID and now you send the client secret, which we use to verify the call. And then you send the code, which you've got in the, in the previous flow. Um, and then you send the send the redirect URL again. Okay, and then you get back you you get back an authorization authorization um, access token. Okay, um, and in the in the consent screen you saw the saw the site selection. So really, like at this point, we don't know we don't know which app which sites the end user can access to. So we have to hit hit a special API in Atlassian to check, check which APIs the user can access to. So we'll just use the access token we got in the, in the previous step. We add it in, in an HTTP header, um, in an authorization header, and we call this accessible resources API. Um, and what we get back is a list of what we call sites. So the sites have an ID, so that's that's really like the most important bit. So that ID is is uh, how we use to identify the site in the new Atlassian API gateway. So that's the that's the thing your app is really interested to, in. The, in. Um, the sites uh, also have a name. So sometimes sometimes that name actually matches the matches the host name of the site. So it could be it could be an ecosystem.atlassian.net but it's actually something the admins, admins can set, set themselves. So the host name is just the default, so you shouldn't really trust, um, uh, trust that and try to use, use it to do stuff. You actually have to, have to, have to check the host name using, uh, using some other API instead once you know the cloud ID. So it could be used if you want to, 
let's say in it, in your app, if you want to if you want to display a site picker, if you want to give the give the user an option to show like um, option to select which sites they want to access, then you can use this uh, this name in the in the site picker. And we also have have an avatar for the site, so you can display you can display an avatar for the site. And then we also show which scopes uh, which scopes uh, were granted access for for that site. Okay, now that we know the cloud ID for the site, we can call an API. So that's uh, really quite simple. So all the APIs now live under api.atlassian.com. So in, in this example, we have Jira. So all the, all the normal Jira APIs, like the Jira APIs you would use, uh, use for connect, they are kind of mounted under x um, slash Jira path. And then after x slash, x slash Jira, you put the cloud ID you got in the accessible resources um, request. And then comes the rest of the normal Jira site URL. So in this example, it's just REST API project. And it will give you all of the projects. You just add the, add the access token you just got, uh, got in, in an authorization header, like in the accessible resources call, and that's, that's it. So basically, that's it. That's how you, that's how you build build a functional real low app. And as you saw, you could just run it, run it, run it in a browser manually. You, know, you can go, you can go to developer.atlasend.com, create create a new app, and you can do a REST call like really, really easily, manually, if you want. So you don't even need need to have a server running running if you just want to play around. And even implementing that server is not going to be not going to be super hard. Once, once you need it, um, it's kind of available for Jira platform. So Jira platform is the common, common API we use in all of the Jira products, like Jira Service Desk, Jira Core, Jira, um, Jira software. So issues, projects, stuff like that. Um, it's also available for Jira Service Desk um, and Confluence. And what available means at the moment as of um, yesterday is that um, um, Jira and Jira Service Desk are kind of uh, in a public beta. So anybody, anybody can go to developer.atlasend.com and create a new app, app for Jira and Jira Service Desk. So you can, you can start writing new apps. But if you want to make, make your app public, um, so that uh, somebody else can uh, can uh, can install authorize your app you have to you have to open open up a ticket ticket with us and then we'll do some kind of review um, and confluence uh, confluence is uh, still i think in in private beta so you have to actually be in touch touch with us if you want to want to use the confluence api using um, using real low, but will probably give you that access and it will probably be available for everybody real soon. And also like the restriction about making the apps public will go away soon, I hope in like a couple of weeks or so. Okay, a couple of more things. So as, um, as I mentioned before, um, like these real low apps are actually installed, installed by users, so there's no admin involved in any of this. So we have a couple of kind of extra things to make make sure this access is somehow under control that you can you can use this stuff securely. Um, so the end end users themselves have this new connected app tab in the in, in their profile. So that's um, that's going to give give them give them a list of all the all the apps they have granted access to in their on uh, on basically on, on any of the sites. Uh, you can also remove the access. You can get some details about which scopes are selected. Um, admins, admins also get uh, get get a list of connected apps in the in the site administrator. So you can see you can see which which apps have have been given access to your site, and then you can see um, see see details about which users have grants for the sites and which scopes the apps have. Um, I have one more thing, a couple of Atlassian specific disclaimers. I'll just run this through really quickly because I'm running out of time. So this I explained already in more detail. So we have multiple sites. Some users may have 
more than one side. Um, I can't remember the exact statistics, but it's something like 95% of the users have just one site, and then 5% might have more than one. So most of them have only one, but really like you should be able to handle the case where they have, have more than one. Um, the grants are account-wide, so uh, site-wide, sorry. So we, we only give access to one, one site at a time. So that's a bit different from, from, from some other solutions and kind of as a consequence, different sites may have different levels of access. So if you have one version of your app that only needed read access to stuff, some user might go, go through that flow for one site and then you have, then you have um, next version of the app that also needs write. So the same user might go through that flow but on a different site. So you can have kind of mix of a mix, a mix of scopes on different sites. It's a bit of an edge case, but um, just something to be aware of. Um, tokens can expire, so uh, because so you can use this special offline access scope to get get a refresh token, which you can save save securely in your app, and then you can use that refresh token to get get a new access token without sending without sending sending the user through the flow again. Yeah, and you should save the refresh tokens securely. They don't expire at the moment, so don't don't lose them. Um, scopes can be flexible, so so like I mentioned, different sites can have have different scopes if the app hasn't been asking for all the scopes for all the sites all the time. Um, and then also something to know is that the scopes are additive. So if you send the same user through the constant flow again, again we we'll just keep on adding adding new scopes. So so all of the if you send if you send send the user with uh, with just read for the first time you get read and then if you send them with the just write for the second time they still have both read and write so if you want, want to get rid of all the old scopes they like the only way to do it at the moment is for the end user to delete delete uh, uh, remove the authorization for that app but really I guess that's that's more of an edge case um, all the documentation is on developer.atlasgen.com. So this link should point into the page where we have the have the docs. So you can use use this link to get started if you want to if you want to try things out, or you can just try to Google for Shira through low and then that should take you into the right place in the in the docs. And that's it.